Log is videotaping. Because the log is scrolling. Oh. I know. Guys, the hot dog starting. Get your nose out. Your parents can all hear. Your parents can all hear how loud you are. So, what is this photograph, guys? Okay. What is this photo representative of? What was I talking about when I was talking about this photograph? Lincoln. So, government's moving from um, Death Valley to, or the Jordan Valley, yep. the Highlands, how they go back and forth and how far they go to the Jordan Valley. That's right. And what is it an example of? Country. Country. Uh, nomadic people. Well, it is a nomadic people, but what is the, the reference that we're talking about here, Matt? Uh, cultural landscape. Yeah, how culture impacts landscape. And we also talked about this picture, which is a photograph, an aerial view, aerial view looking down into the Red Sea. Here's the Dead Sea down here. And we have the state of Israel, right? And the cultural landscape indeed being impacted by the politics of this region as well. Um, and kind of indicating in many ways even the um, heightened conflict between people on one side of the Jordan Valley and on the other. The history of these people is something that we'll talk about in a future lecture, especially when we're talking about political geography and how geography and politics um, sometimes go really hand in hand. But, you know, one of the things that I would say, just as sort of a life lesson and something for you guys to really think about as you grow up and sort of set priorities for your life is going to places like this, it's pretty incredible what you can learn. And I learned an enormous amount about the cultural landscape, the impact that culture has had on this place and these people just by being there. So I encourage you guys to be, um, be explorers and travelers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. That my recommendation that you be a traveler, will that be on? No, <laughs> like, like the thing about the Dead Sea. And, uh, what do you think? What do you if guess? I'm covering it in, an ex in a... Yeah, oh. Sure. oh, shucks. I have the wrong. Hold on, guys. No, it's videotaping this entire mistake that I made. It's just that I have the wrong. That's the. Yeah, well, I was going to show you guys. Let me show you really quickly. We don't have much time. So I have to log in here. This is really just a way of showing you guys um, Google Earth and this example of what I was talking about with regards to Israel. If I put... Um, So if you type in Israel, here's what you're going to see from Google Earth. So it's going to take you to the country of Israel. And what you'll, you're able to see here is, can you identify the Jordan Valley? Oh, yeah. yeah, here's the country of Jordan. Here's the capital of Amman. Here's the Jordan Valley right in here. Okay, so you see the Dead Sea down here. So this is that whole valley region. So I wonder if um, but if we go in closer, again, you can see this difference between the green of Israel and this more barren landscape of Jordan. And some of that is simply just the site. Some of that is simply just what this place is like. Um, but all of, also, there are cultural interactions and the way, again, the point I'm trying to make here is the way that culture and geography can have a really enormous impact on a space. So you have two people who are in really deep conflict. And they've been in conflict with each other since the 1950s on a really intense level. To the extent that 
You know, um, people are um, killing each other in these two countries over the politics. But also, the landscape has been impacted deeply because of um, the Israeli use of the water resources compared to the Jordanians, which is, again, another element of this unrest. So that, that's the component of cultural landscape that I wanted you guys to get from this. Okay, so let's go back to this slide, slideshow. Here we go. All right. So this, under this whole um, cultural landscape heading, we also have some subtopics. And remember, this is all within the notion of region, because regions are really highly determined by culture. And culture has a major impact on the way people live and how they interact. And cultural ecology is the geographic study of human environmental relationships. So how people are actually interacting um, and how the environment is interacting back with human beings. And this was one of the um, terms sort of differentiating these two terms. It's really critical. So environmental determinism is what? What does that mean? It's, yeah, it, it's really, like, kind of, if you take the two words, it's saying that the environment determines, that the environment itself determines the potential of the people and the land. Now, that actually was a theory that was really popular um, up until the mid-20th century. Once um, ge geographers um, and social scientists got more into the mid-20th century, some, something really dramatic happened. Do you guys know what it was? What changed this perspective on environmental determinism? Because prior to this, what geographers would have said, and social, social scientists in general would have said, is that people's potential is largely determined based on their geography and their environment. If you grew up in a place that's rich in resources, you're going to be rich. If you have a civilization that was formed and developed in a place that had access to great natural resources, domesticatable animals, um, lots of great water sources, that civilization was going to be more successful. That was something that when I'm talking in my world history classes about this exact notion. You guys, for the most part, your families are derived from Europeans. Europeans are derived primarily from people from actually the part of the world we were just looking at, the Middle East. Those Middle Eastern civilizations were born out of a place called Mesopotamia, which is actually right in the middle of modern day Iraq. And in Mesopotamia, 12,000 years ago, people were really lucky. Geographically speaking, their environment determined their success. In the Middle East, Humans had, um, the civilizations that were there had wheat and barley, two excellent grains that they could store, that they could grow easily, that had high proteins. That meant that the people that lived there had this really great food source, as compared to people, for example, in a place like Papua New Guinea, an island in uh, the southern sort of uh, central Pacific. Actually, it's the, the western Pacific near Australia. And people in New Guinea did not have things like wheat and barley. They had a tree called the sago tree. You can't store sago. It doesn't have much protein. It's super hard to grow. It takes a really long time to grow it. They were environmentally determined not to be able to have this great luck. And so their civilization didn't grow as quickly or as vibrantly. The same thing can be said about domesticatable animals. Of the 14 large domesticatable animals that have ever been domesticated in the world, zero were domesticated in Papua New Guinea. In Central Asia and the Middle East, you have the sheep, you have the cow, you have the horse. Of 14, we're talking about most of the large domesticatable animals. The camel, the oxen. So that's environmental determinism, saying that your fate is determined 
in part by the environment surrounding it. Right? So like now it's more like we have natural environment. And that is possibilism. Something happened in the mid-20th century where geographers started looking at things slightly differently. Can you guys guess what it was or what forces were changed? What's different now than it was back then? We have more ability to change our environment. Technology has allowed us to change our environment, but also communication technology and transportation. That, that could be a potential part of it. That's, that's possible. I think that most geographers would say that the um, environmental determinism sort of faded away once people were able to actually get out of the regions that they were from or to communicate outside those regions. Here's the story I want to tell you about this. When I was living in Morocco, um, I was um, I would use internet cafes because my host family didn't have a computer and there isn't widespread wireless internet available. So if you want to use a computer, for the most part, you have to go to an internet cafe. It's still like that in a lot of parts of, of Morocco. Um, and this is in the city. If you live in a rural area, there's no, there's no internet cafes for the most part. But in the city of Fez, which is where I was living, Fez, um, yep, it's funny, but um, it's actually a city, um, they had an uh, internet cafe pretty close to the school I was attending. And so I would go there on a regular basis and I would send emails back home. And at the desk next to me at this internet cafe were three young Moroccan men. These men were born in a country that's part of the developing world. They very likely had maybe high school educations, um, high school educations which did not frankly include computers. The best, most sophisticated high school in all of Morocco, which is in the capital city of Rabat, which I was able to visit when I was there, has 24 computers. This is the best high school in Morocco, has 24 computers. So these guys probably did not have access to computers growing up, and they certainly probably didn't have them at home, that's why they're at the internet cafe. But these guys were selling carpets online. They had an online business, I was watching them. They had a website that they had set up, and they were importing carpets from the mountain regions in Morocco, and they were selling them online to people all over the world. Their environment did not determine whether they were going to be successful. Communication technology, transportation technology, um, all of these kinds of things, education to a large extent as well, has made possibleism. So modern geographies generically reject environmental determinism in favor of possibleism because they say it is no more, no longer is it true that people are entirely determined by their environment. No matter where you live, even in the middle of, of Morocco. Yeah. Well, possibilism is the term that we use to sort of say, now here's the new way of thinking about the world. The old way was, if you were born in Central Africa, and you didn't have access to uh, great crops or an environment that was going to nurture you, or then you were, you were stuck. But now we say that with transportation technology, communication technology, anything's possible. If you're born in Central Africa and you get your hands on a cell phone, it's possible for you to do more. Your environment doesn't necessarily determine that anymore. So under this same heading of regions, which is why we're talking about culture, we need to talk about, well, then what are the types of regions? And there are three primary types of regions that we're going to talk about. And I noticed on your quizzes, and this counts for the A-day class and the B-day class, um, that you guys really struggle with these three regions and identifying what they were. And this is actually something I find really interesting, so I'm, I'm glad we're going to talk about it because I find it kind of fascinating. So the three regions formal or uniform, functional or nodal, and vernacular or cultural regions. And I'm going to be using formal, functional, and vernacular as we go through here, but those are other names for it. So some simple examples of these regions. Um, a formal region, for example, is Montana. A formal region is a region that is defined by one shared trait among all the people in that region. What do all the people of Montana share? What's the characteristic? A 
a Montana government. Yes, they are ruled by, they are defined by a state government. The formal region of Wisconsin, right, we are defined by our government. But you could also say the United States is a formal region. So you can have formal regions within formal regions. Go ahead. The state includes her. Yep. States and countries are defined because of their government, right? But you can also have a formal region that is based on something like um, language. So everybody shares a common trait. And so all the people, Brazil, not only does Brazil, is it a formal region because of its government, but also its language is Portugal, or Portuguese. So it has that trait as well that defines it formal. It's a shared, sort of hard trait. Yep. The parish of the church. Um, that would probably be more of a, a functional region. So we'll talk about that. But a church, like Christian, like the Christian characteristic, yeah. right? Or like Catholics, if you have a region that's predominantly Catholic, that would be. But a parish is similar to a functional region. And a functional region is uh, an area that has some function that it sort of shares. So the parish, because it is led by a bishop who has certain tasks that he does within that region, that is his functioning region. So the circulation area of the newspaper. Another one is a television station. So we get, what TV station do we get? Like what, what news stations do we get? ABC, right? But where is it headed out of? Madison. If I go, I'm going to my sister's house this weekend, and she doesn't get Madison uh, TV stations, she gets Milwaukee TV stations. That's a functional region. The region, there's a functioning uh, operation that defines the region. And I'm going to give you more examples of this in just a second. I'm going to. And then finally, a vernacular region, which is um, thinking, of it, thinking of it as like um, a culture region. What a vernacular region is, is it is a region that is defined by the people who live in it. So it is a, 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 it's a much, if you think about it like this, it goes from sort of hard to soft. These are really hard boundaries. Really secure, hard, straightforward boundaries. All the way to a soft boundary, the American South. If I had you all write down right now which states belong in the American South, I would probably get a variety of different answers. How many people in here, when you think of the South, you think of Missouri? Right? But Missourians would very likely think of themselves as Southerners, especially in Southern Missouri, right? So do you split Missouri in half? If you're writing it vernacularly, you might. So it's a region that's defined by the users, typically based on some cultural trait. Well, let's go back and look at formal region with a couple more examples that I think will clear this up in case you're still struggling. Areas in which certain characteristics are found throughout that area. So, for example, French-speaking Africa. This is a map of French-speaking Africa. They have a single trait that binds them together. That is a region. It's kind of amazing, isn't it, how much of Africa you can travel in. You can, if you speak French, you can travel easily through these regions. And the ones over here that are um, grayed out, you can largely travel using English in those regions. So you will, here you have mostly Arabic, and down here you're going to have some English um, and Dutch. There's also a couple of other languages, African, African. Yeah. Uh, that right there, that is actually Lebanon. This tiny one down here? That's true. Oh, and then the library I don't know exactly how they're defining this. It might be sort of like information unavailable. Western Sahara is right now and has been for a lot of years in a, a state of real turmoil. They have a really unbalanced government. 
as, as a matter of fact, Morocco claims Western Sahara as part of it, so there's a lot of fighting across this border. So I'm not sure why it's light blue, but it might be, could be for a couple of different reasons. Okay, but also the Muslim world. This is a formal region. Look at, you have this entire part of North Africa is called the Maghreb. And it, in Arabic, that is sort of the region of North Africa that's part of the Muslim world. So the Muslim world is, again, this shared trait that we, that's how we define that region. Okay? Does that make sense? Functional region, then, here are some examples. Hollywood is a great example of a functional region. There is sort of a central purpose of that region, you know, movie making, um, the entertainment industry, and it operates from sort of this hub within this area. But the lines are somewhat more um, informal than an actual solidly based region. Um, another great example, what's this? Can you guess what this is? Yes, Pizza Hut. This is a Pizza Hut delivery area. Again, a functional region. So you have this region that has it has an operation it's set up in order to, to actually have an operation that functions from. So an area organized around a node or focal point place where there is a central focus that diminishes in importance outward. And that's why I would say the parish is a is a, a functional region because the central place is what? Right. But, or the parish office or whatever. Used to display information about economic areas on. A vernacular region. Raise your hand if you live in Badger country. Yeah. Right? Raise your hand if you live in Packer country. Right? I mean, yeah. this idea, we yeah. define it, right? Parker's saying no. Yeah. Right? It's the users who define it. Yeah. And we can have an argument about why Packers are so much better than Vikings, but we'll save that for a different day. All of you. Okay, anyway, yeah, I, we, we won't I, go into that. We won't go I into know that. I respect your dedication, but not your own. Okay. Um, just kidding, Parker. But, yeah, so does that make sense? Does that help? The notion of badger country, right? This, the Bible Belt. How many people have ever heard that phrase used? It is something that different individuals will actually have different interpretations of a place that people believe exists as a part of their cultural identity. Can you think of another vernacular region? You believe it exists because of your cultural identity. Yeah. Sure, right. Do they have like a cubby land? Like, I don't know. Well, in Chicago, it makes me think of this because Wrigley is, is in the middle of a vernacular region of Chicago called, do you know what it's called? Well, Wrigleyville, yeah. And so that's a vernacular region. You could also look at it as kind of functional, right, because it's got that sort of hub. But I would say also just south of that is a region called Boys Town. Do you guys know what the vernacular region in, in Chicago that's called Boys Town is? It's an area that has a lot of gay bars, a lot of gay men and women live there. Um, and it was started as a place where gay men live together in a more sort of safe um, community, uh, a community where they kind of had, you know, commonalities and connections with one another. And so that is a vernacular region as well. When people say like, oh, it's Boys Town or Polish Town or, you know, those kinds of things. So um, it belie it's believed to exist because of the users who use it. Does that help with those three? Do you get those right on the test? I hope so. Okay. Come on. Okay, moving on to the next topic. So that was region, you guys. So we've talked about region now and the most, I think, critical components of region. Now let's talk about scale. So we still have scale, connections, and do we have one more? Oh, space. Space, okay. All right, so scale. I'm gonna go through this quickly. Relationship between the portion of the Earth being, portion of the Earth being studied um, and the Earth as a whole. So how do these things compare, right? How do we compare 
um, the portion we're studying to the actual physical size. And you guys did really well on this on your quiz. So I know you know the difference between ration or fraction scale, written scale, and graph scale. So these are just sort of three different examples of that up here. It's hard to read, I apologize. Any questions about how math scale is written? I feel like I don't need to spend a ton of time because I you guys did do a good job on it. Yeah. I'll do graphic scale. Okay, so who can tell how a graphic scale is written? <laughs> Come on up here, Abby. Wait, can I just ask him to start first? Come, come up here. So you're writing a scale for a map, and you want to write it graphically. How's it going to look? No. What's a graph? What are the characteristics of a graph? Somebody give her one hint. Okay. That's why. Is this going to have an XY axis? This graph? No, this isn't that kind of graph. What's it going to have, you guys? Tell her what to draw. It's going to have a line. Draw a line. What else is it going to have? It's going to have two numbers. Got it. Yep. Yep. That's it. It's that simple. It is a line that tells you this. Good job, Abby. This distance equals 100 miles. Okay? So it's not as complicated as it sounds. You'll see some graphic um, scales that are complicated, but they, they don't have to be. But scale also can be about projection, because we're talking about size. And when you project something, it's often distorted. So projection is an image of the Earth that is placed on a map surface, right? On my back wall, I have a projection of the world, right? I should get my, I have to get my globes out. I have some blow up um, globes. That's a different view of the world. But we're taking it and we're projecting it onto a flat surface. And when you do that, you have distortion. And distortion can come in shape, distance, size, and direction. What map is over on my wall that will I have two projections, actually, um, on that back wall. Two very different kinds of projections. One's called a Mercator projection, and one is called a Peters projection. What do you notice about the two? And they're actually up here, too. This is Mercator. This is Peters. What do you notice? What are the distortions? Go ahead, Isaac. That's right. So we have some distortion based on um, some of the, the shapes and, and placement, right? And distortion based on place, placement can um, affect, I mean, in the old way of doing it, in the Mercator projections, or I shouldn't, um, sometimes what they would do when I was in school, almost all the maps that my teachers had put the United States in the middle. And in order to do that, what do you have to do? Well, you got to slice Asia in half. So Asia would be cut in half so that the United States would get this dominant central position. And that is a distortion. Or it can lead to distortion, let me just say that. What do you think about that? Yeah, differences um, between them. Mercator's on the top, right? Yes, this is Mercator. Mercator is Peter. That one distorts size yes. more. And Peters? That's exactly right. Mercator distorts for size. Peters distorts for shape. Peters was created in an attempt to try to correct some of the distortions for size in the Mercator. This was the classically used map. Which hemisphere gets the shaft in the Mercator projection? Yeah. Look at that, you guys. Come look at Mexico and Alaska on the Mercator. Now look at Mexico and Alaska on the Peters. You can see it better over there. Mexico is actually bigger than Alaska. But if you look at it on here, look at how much bigger. Look at Greenland. It's like bigger than Africa. Yes. Africa is smaller than Greenland on the Mercator map. And what 
Some geographers argue, and that's why they argue for the use of a map like this, which trades size distortion for shape distortion, was that they said that at least this does not give predominance to a largely white region of the world and lead to these sort of um, maybe um, unknowingly racist kinds of um, impressions that people have of this giant dominance of the Northern Hemisphere. And it was created, this Peter's projection was created in the latter half of the 20th century in the sort of, in a world where we did think about race and we thought about inequity and these kinds of things really differently than people thought about it before. When Mercator did his projection, people were like, mm, whatever, who cares? But we now are way more sensitive to saying like, that's not okay to simply shrink Africa down to a fraction of its actual size because it, it sort of gives this impression, especially think about little kids, the impression that it gives about the dominance and importance of a place. I mean, a, country, a, a continent like Africa, it, it dominates in terms of size and, and should have a significant role to play in what, the way we think about environmental issues, political issues globally. Um, but if you look at it, this being this tiny little space, it maybe doesn't seem as important. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Can you try and talk about what you mean in one of the lectures where like the first one? Uh -huh. and the picture is wrong. Ah. So uh, you were talking about the map comparing them, or you were doing And it was confusing, so yeah. it was just clear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. good. Yeah, it flashed through. Okay, good. I'm glad this clears up then. Okay. There we go. So, um, scale can also be expressed in terms of globalization. Because globalization is really changing the relative distance. For example, um, when I was in college, back in the days, before you guys were born, which is tragic, frankly, depresses me. Did you hear that? I still look 21. You guys are calling me. Okay, I did have a lifeguard today. Okay. Anyway, so, um, but when I was in college in the 90s, I lived in Denmark. Who knows where Denmark is? Matt. Yeah. Yes, it sits right on top of Germany. If my map was up, I could point it out. It sits right on top of Germany, and um, it's um, considered a, a country of um, Scandinavia. So, yeah, I can tell you the dots. The dots get me so email, and then you have the university, six or four dots. Yes. Yes. So I said I can speak Danish. I don't speak Danish very well, but when I was in university, I had six years of Danish. But I, oh no, three years. I did six years. I wasn't in college for six years. Okay. Six, six terms of, of uh, um, Danish. Okay. So the, um, the reason I'm telling you about this is because when I was living in Denmark, if I wanted to talk to my friends, I wrote them letters. I made one phone call home, and it was on Thanksgiving. My parents called me one other time, and it was when my grandma died. Now, when I was in Thailand, this was two years ago, every single day I checked my email, every single day I Skyped with people back here at Lodi, um, every single day I communicated with friends on Facebook, the relative distance between myself and my home on a, on a globalization scale was totally different in those two trips. That time-space compression, that's what that's talking about. When I was in college and living in Denmark, and maybe someday my host brother Casper, who is not a friendly ghost, um, will see this video and I, he will be proud of me that I'm talking all about my time in Denmark. 11 now, he's like, you know, 30 probably. Um, but, you know, when I was living with Casper, I did not have that close spatial relationship with my friends at home. It took a week to get any mail. I didn't have much phone call. That is also scale. That's changing the relative distance between, even if it's metaphorical, even if it's distance for communication purposes, 
Think about the distance or the scale of transportation from the time um, when the first, the, the time of um, the Titanic to today. Why were people on that ship in the first place? Some were migrating, but what were they literally doing? They were crossing the Atlantic, right? And how long was that? They, it was supposed to be the fastest ship, right? And still, how long was that journey supposed to take? Yeah. So this relative distance is also part of it. And also the globalization of economics, how quickly things move. If I had you guys right now all take your shoes off and tell me where your shoes came from, 100% of you would say China. Because that is where the vast majority of, oh, now you're doing it, I know, it's, you're curious. That's all, except if you have, okay, if you have hugs, then they're probably from like Australia. Okay, everyone, if there's someone who has seen this, look at your shoe. Vietnam. Vietnam. Oh, the Vietnamese are making some cheap shoes now, too, aren't they? Oh, okay. oh my gosh, okay, I'm wrong. Indonesia. Uh, but the, but the point is, yeah, Nike's making stuff in Vietnam. The point is, the point is made because they're coming from where? Out of, the out of the U.S. Your clothing comes from out of the U.S. Your relative well, connection. Well, yep. <laughs> this is partly because of transportation networks, but also global culture. Have you guys seen this video of this Korean guy, this Korean rapper guy? Oh, oh one of the news? The one in the news? Yeah. What time is it? Cambodia. Now, let me tell you guys this. Um, oh. Well, then, oops. This is, you guys, this is globalization of culture. We have to watch the ad. This is globalization of culture. How so? In what way? Hey, stick with me. How is this globalization of culture? I, Isaac, you're a great dancer. How is this globalization of culture? Answer me, please. No. Why is this globalization of culture? What's going on here? We have exported this culture to South Korea, to the rest of the world. This is culture exported out. Our largest export in this country, <laughs> listen, listen, our largest export in this country is not grain. Yeah. We're, you guys, if we have time at the end, I want you to just listen to me. Why am I even showing you this? If I looked up on here also, um, African rappers, is that an export or an import? Yes. African rap is also an export because we have exported this culture of hip hop to the rest of the world. Sometimes people are surprised because we think of African Americans and hip hop, but these are Africans. These aren't African Americans, of course, it's completely different. So, again, this idea of the globalization of culture. Um, Okay. Isaac, if you aren't careful, I'm going to turn this computer around and show everybody your dance. Okay. So, space is our next topic. And then after this, we have just connections. And then I'm done with this uh, discussion. Auburn pertaining to space on or near the Earth's surface, often a synonym for geographically. Uh, and used for geographically and used as an adjective to describe specific geographic concepts or processes. So it is pertaining to space on the Earth's surface. 
So how we define this space. And there's a couple of topics that fall underneath space. Distribution of features. When you're thinking about how space is divided up, looking at things like density, concentration, and pattern. Look at these four examples. Which of those examples, A, B, C, or D, is an example of pattern? B, why? Right, a regular order. So space can be defined regularly, right? The desks in this classroom, how would you describe their arrangement? Would you describe them um, as a pattern or as sort of randomized? There's absolutely a pattern. But you can also describe them in terms of their density, the frequency with which something is occurring. And density can be the uh, arithmetic density, so the total number of objects within a defined space, physiological, the number of people that are suitable for living within a specific space, and agricultural, which is the number of people that can be supported on the farmland of a particular space. So then what's concentration? If density is the frequency that something occurs, what is concentration? All of these have density, right? They all have a set density. What is their, what's the density of C? Yeah, it's three dots per this box, right? A is one, two, three, four, five, six box per this spot. Yep. Which ones have the same density? Which ones have the same density? A and D. But what's different about them? They have the same density, but they have different. Neither of them are a pattern. Distribution. They have different, not distribution, concentration. Which one is more concentrated? Yep. So concentration, you can have the same density, but have a different concentration. So concentration is like how close. Yes, how concentrated, how close together objects within a certain defined space are. So the desks in the middle of my room are more what? Concentrated. Yes. You guys are getting it. That's it. This is, I want to give you guys, I had a professor in college who used to do this when there were things on the test. H-I-N-T. Okay, H-I-N-T. So, Oh my God! Somebody can tell you. Okay, don't say that. Okay, and then diffusion again is part of this way of defining space—a process by which a characteristic spreads across space and over time. So that is diffusion, how it spreads, and again, H I N T, because we have diffusion in a lot of different ways, right? First of all, the hearth is the source. The hearth is a source. If Emily comes in the room and she starts singing, um, right, and she starts singing it, and then slowly, Brandon, what are you going to start doing? I mean, what started happening even as we were, as I was doing it? It started diffusing, but she's the heart. She's the center. She was the start. So we have relocation and expansion diffusion. So relocation diffusion, if we're in here and we're all singing, okay, and Emily, what would be an example of her doing relocation expand or diffusion of that? She goes to her fourth law class, three or fourth law. She goes to her science class, Ms. Belcher. Ms. Tembarge. And she goes in Ms. Tembarge's room and she starts singing. And other people start singing it. That is relocation. Okay? It goes somewhere else. So it is taken to a new location. It's relocated through a diffusion process. But also, expansion diffusion can exist. And expansion diffusion exists on three different levels. 
You can have it hierarchical, contagious, and stimulants. So, go a drop of golden sun. How would hierarchical um, diffusion work in that case? Okay, if Mr. Brunning did it, or even better, if you want to get the entire Lodi High School class or the kids in Lodi High School singing, who would you who would start it? Maybe the seniors, right? Or like people who have power within a society or a system. If you had Mr. Silver. If you had the people within that community that had power, so if the most popular girl in school starts wearing a banana behind her ear, right, and then no. I'm just whatever, or starts wearing big hoop earrings, what? How does hierarchical diffusion work? It goes from top down, right? What about contagious expansion diffusion then? Yes, exactly. Like a rumor, the way a rumor spreads from individual to individual. Yep, it can it can be completely mysterious. Yeah. Did that be kind of real? Like she started in this class, and not every one of us felt that we were next class. That could be a way for contagious diffusion to work. Yep. Or that's right. And what about stimulus diffusion? Can we use? Don't. Or if you guys all just started snapping. Right? You take one part, whatever part of that stimulus that is working, and it becomes part of the way that things are done. It spreads. Just a part of it. Even if I'm an idiot, and you guys would never go to your class and say, don't. But you might have a, yeah, you just might want to snap now, right? Okay, and what's a really good example of stimulus diffusion? Uh, a mouse. A mouse, right. Good. Okay, you're going to do good on this test. I can feel it. Okay, we talked about time-space compression. So that has to do, of course, with space and how we determine space. So I'm going to move through that quickly. And again, spatial interactions. You can go back online and look at these if you want um, the information. I'll post all this stuff up there if you want to copy that stuff down. But we did talk about time-space compression already. But again, this idea of how spatially we interact with each other and how things have changed in terms of our spatial interactions. Oh my god, are you kidding? Is at the end? OK, I'm going to finish this up. You guys will have the rest of um, It's only going to be like five more minutes. Come and see me at your intervention periods if you want to talk about the test. Quiz yourself on um, the online, what you call it? Uh, okay. Tester? Dealy? Hey. I did. It's still running. I'll be right back. How would you, how would you actually do that? Witnesses. Witnesses to my amazing singing voice. Uh, it's Liam. Yeah. Hi. I'm giving you two. Somebody up here. Have you read? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Have you read? Um. Um. Delirium. No, Okay, so I'm just going to finish up talking about spatial interaction and distance decay in particular I want to talk about. Because what we're talking about here again, this 
this notion of spatial interaction and how that sort of defines us geographically. And because of globalization, we talked about this a little bit before when we were talking about globalization, we have these transportation and electronic communication networks that have changed our connections to each other. I talked about my example of living in Denmark and having that new kind of spatial interaction, being able to actually cross the spatial divide much more easily. But there's also a phenomenon called distance decay. And distance decay essentially says that there is a change or a, a depletion of any idea or notion the further away you get from that hub or that heart. And so um, understanding that things change as they move through space and sometimes they decay. Um, and then finally, connection. So this is the last of those key concepts from the unit. Um, so the relationships among people and objects across the barrier of space, and those connections are going to be both economic, okay, come to the office, please. cultural, commercial, political, and environmental. We are interconnected with one another in really dramatic ways. And once again, I'm going to bring up that notion of globalization. So H-I-N-T, right? You need to know how globalization has affected us. And it's affected us economically because we have many more connections. Those young men I mentioned living in Morocco who are connected economically to people in places like New York and Montana because of their um, ability to cross those spatial divides using technology. But also our cultural connections. We have all kinds of incredible cultural connections that are coming in from the outside world. For example, if you think about, you know, you can go to, to Madison and get any kind of food, any kind of culture from around the world, sushi. But so deeply enmeshed has other cultural traditions become in our own culture that something like the taco is almost, from an American perspective, no longer considered really outside of our culture. But also distance decay means that the space, the, the change over space to that, that taco has made it something almost entirely unique to, to the United States. If you go to Mexico, you're not going to find Mexicans eating anything that really resembles what we think of as the taco. Um, commercial connections, um, think about a place like Walmart and its um, almost ubiquitous connection around the world, meaning that everywhere in the world, um, not everywhere, but in many parts of the world, there are within Walmarts. But the even better connection is an example, is McDonald's. And McDonald's is both an example of globalization, meaning that they have connected to all different parts of the world, um, as well as this change culturally and the cultural adaptations that McDonald's has made. And you guys have seen this probably laying around in my room. And this Micarabia container is a great example of the way that McDonald's has adapted culturally to keep this connection um, alive across countries, across space, um, through a commercial product, a commercial business like this. Um, and then political as well as environmental connections. We are connected politically in vast ways, not just because of our um, the amount of money that we donate and give to other countries, but also because of our involvement in wars and those kinds of and then, of course, environmentally, we are no longer sort of on an island all by ourselves. The United States produces 25% of the carbon emissions around the world, um, even though we have a much smaller fraction of that of the world's population. And so our environmental behaviors are also connecting us with other people because we're changing the air, literally, that people are breathing. And so this is all components of the, uh, the connection. Um, finally, the last sort of component here to talk about really is um, this, uh, this new world of communication. This is just an example of how deeply connections are changing around the world. This is, um, I did this a few months ago, uh, maybe around a year ago. Um, there's, a, there's a site that you can use. It's called um, My Friend Map, and you can actually use this to map out where all of your friends around the world are. And this is what my map looks like. So on Facebook, this is how interconnected I am with the world. I would suspect that yours looks similar. I would suspect that many of you have lots of connections around the world. Um, and all those issues, time, space, compression, distance decay, all that stuff is relevant.
And in order to kind of monitor these connections and look at the, the world and space and its connectedness, we use these contemporary tools like um, GPS, global positioning systems, remote sensing, geographic information systems, and so on. Okay, so that's the end. Um, study hard, prepare for that uh, exam. Hopefully this, uh, these lectures will help review some of the key details for you. Come and see me if you have any questions. In our next unit, we're gonna be talking about population. So I wish you the very best of luck.